And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice. Again, we will start with topical questions. And can I advise members that question number nine has been withdrawn? And I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister specifically in relation to prisoners who are sentenced for terrorist offences and where part of their sentence involves them being subject to licence in the community, who actually provides the supervision? I'm not asking who notionally provides it, who on paper provides it, who actually provides it, the supervision in the community. Deputy Speaker, I am somewhat baffled in that that question does seem remarkably similar to one which has been withdrawn uh, from the main question list for written answer. But, uh, as, as, I, order, order. I assume, it, I assume it is in order for the member to, uh, to trump himself by, uh, by asking the question as a topical, in which case the answer is that where licence conditions are imposed on persons released from prison, they are monitored by the probation board with support where appropriate from the police, the prison service and my department. Individuals released on licence are subject to a combination of standard conditions set out in legislation and where relevant additional conditions. The aim of these conditions is to reduce the risk of harm to the public, reduce reoffending, and support the resettlement of the offender. A license may be revoked and the offender recalled to custody where it is considered the risk of harm posed by an individual can no longer be safely managed within the community. Before I call Jim for something, I could I ask members to uh, be respectful in the chamber and to listen carefully to the minister's response? I call Jim Allister. Could I suggest to the minister the answer he has given us is the answer as to what is supposed to happen, what on paper happens. But the reality on the ground is very different because probation service refused to monitor terrorist prisoners. And is it not the case that there are many terrorist prisoners supposedly on license in the community who are never monitored because of that refusal by probation service? And is he trying to cover that up? Um, certainly, Deputy Speaker, I don't make a habit of covering things up. I think my record of coming to this House on a number of occasions when things have been somewhat difficult for the Department of Justice proves otherwise. I have given him a statement as to how regulations uh, provide and how the operational uh, uh, guidance between Probation Board, Prison Service, Police and my department has operated since 2011. If he has specific examples where he believes that that is not being carried out, I have no doubt he will write to me. I call Anna Lu. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In June, the Minister undertook to write to the Finance Minister uh, about the issue of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Equal Pay Settlement. Uh, will the Minister update the Assembly on that correspondence, please? Yes, Deputy Speaker. I did indeed write to the then Finance Minister in June. Uh, it's been part of an ongoing uh, series of correspondence. That, um, I'm sure members would not wish me to bore them with the full detail of it. Uh, but certainly I welcome the fact that the new Finance Minister uh, adopted a position at question time in this assembly, I think a fortnight ago today, uh, in which he, uh, he gave a clear indication of his willingness to look again at the equal pay issue. I certainly am very keen to see the equal pay issue resolved, but the reality is that the resolution is not within my powers as Minister of Justice. If it is possible to get a solution on a cross-executive basis, I would be very pleased. I call Anna Lu. I thank the Minister. Um, certainly, I, w I welcome the, the Finance Minister's commitment as well. Um, is it fair then, Minister, uh, to, if I can ask the Minister, is it fair uh, to say then the Justice Minister uh, will fully support a cross uh, departmental, cross party? Um, cross-party approach, um, as this is very clearly a cross-departmental, cross-party uh, issue. And if central funding uh, can be found, that the Minister will fully uh, support it. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is exactly the case indeed. Sorry, I've just checked it. It was a fortnight ago yesterday the Finance Minister uh, made his point at question time in the Assembly. I wrote to him the following day, making it absolutely clear that I welcomed his intention to carefully consider the matter in the answer he gave that day and outlined why it was not possible for me to take the matter forward, but my willingness to participate in any discussions he wished to have. I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the recent controversy surrounding the sexual exploitation of children. Can the Minister confirm that in the absence of the National Crime Agency operating in this field in Northern Ireland, that we will be left more exposed to this form of criminal activity than other parts of the UK? Well, Deputy Speaker, yes, it is indeed a concern of mine that when the National Crime Agency goes live on the 7th of October, if Northern Ireland is not part of the arrangements, and indeed clearly Northern Ireland cannot now be part of the arrangements from the 7th of October, that there will be something of a gap in our procedures. I'm certainly well aware of the Chief Constable's statement that he uh, will seek to ensure that the PSNI does its best to deal with the issue of child exploitation, but the reality is the specialist expertise for the United Kingdom exists within SEOP at the moment, which is becoming part of the NCA, which in the absence of agreement in this House will not be able to operate in the devolved sphere in Northern Ireland. I call Tom Buchanan. Thank the Minister for his response. But while the opposition of, of some in relation to the National Crime Agency is dressed up as concerns around accountability, is it not the case that there is good reason to believe that, for some, this is more about protecting their erstwhile friends who are involved in smuggling across the border? Well, Deputy Speaker, I have no knowledge as to what may motivate uh, any member of this House in the, in the direction suggested by Mr Buchanan. What I am absolutely clear about is that there will be significant benefits from Northern Ireland if the NCA were able to operate in the devolved sphere, subject to appropriate accountability arrangements, which I believe I have got in discussion with the Home Office. It is an issue which has to be considered in this Assembly as we look at serious issues like child exploitation, human trafficking, and a range of other crimes which come within our domestic legislation and therefore which will not be amenable to full NCA support in the, devo in, in the arrangements under which the NCA will be operating from the 7th of October. The devolved sphere will be left out whilst accepted matters will be covered by the NCA. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I note, Minister, you say you don't hide from uh, any of your responsibility. However, I table the question in relation to the numbers of prison staff within the prisons, particularly in the Gillingham prison, after a visit with the committee. Can the minister put in record whether he's satisfied that the numbers in the prisons in terms of the prison officers is sufficient at the current time? Well, Deputy Speaker, I, I think that Mr Clark will shortly receive the answer to his written question on that, but certainly I am satisfied by the prison service that there are adequate numbers of staff on duty in all three prison institutions at all times. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, th thank you for that answer. Uh, given that we have a representation from the prisoner officers on the day of our visit, has the Minister spoken directly to any of the prison officers in McGilligan, where we have situations where on one wing there are 50 prisoners and one, f uh, one member of staff to look after 50 prisoners at night time? Well, Deputy Speaker, I am not aware that that is the position in McGilligan. It is not the way it has been presented to me. But I think we also have to be realistic about recognising that when risk assessments are done, around uh, the way staff are deployed, sometimes it will be entirely possible that the prisoner to staff ratio is higher in some units than in others. The reality is the vast majority of our prisoners are not in that sense dangerous. And what we need to do is ensure that we get an appropriate staffing level for the different sorts of prisoners in the different parts of the prison estate so we maximise the use of resources and we do not have unnecessary numbers of uh, prison officers in some places that do not require it at the expense of other areas where a higher staff to prisoner ratio would be appropriate. I call David Hildage. Minister, over a period of time the PSNI has developed the policy of reducing hours of local stations and getting officers out from behind desks. Uh, a clear community benefit was outlined. Can I ask the Minister what his assessment of the current policy is? Well, Deputy Speaker, that is very much an operational issue for the Chief Constable as to how he deploys his staff, but certainly overall 
the fact that there are now something in the region of 600 or so officers available for frontline duties rather than performing desk jobs must surely be seen as a positive for all of us. I call David Hildage. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for outlining his, his answer and indeed the fact that it is operational. But, but could he assess uh, maybe some local policies in relation to the PSNI, particularly where there's high levels of criminal uh, activity and there appears to be no action? Well, no, Deputy Speaker, the answer is I can't assess those kind of operational issues uh, by uh, the, the Chief Constable. They are matters which are properly his. The oversight of the Chief Constable is primarily given by the Policing Board. There are arrangements, if he's talking about specific local issues, by which PCSPs can raise matters with their local police commander, but it is very much not the job of the Minister to interfere in those kind of operational decisions. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister to outline the work he's currently taking forward in his department to support the armed forces community? Uh, I'm not aware if the member has any specific suggestions as to, as to what they should be. Perhaps the supplementary will tease them out. But the reality is the Department of Justice fulfills all its obligations to citizens in general, including the armed forces community. Given uh, the dependence that the justice system has on certain small elements of the armed forces in terms of things like the work of the ATOs and bomb disposal uh, and uh, especially search capabilities, uh, we fully recognise the benefits which come to Northern Ireland from the work of the armed forces and the need to ensure that we live up to our responsibilities for members of the armed forces. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer and my supplementary will clarify. But the recent inquiry on the implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant conducted by the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee stated, we recommend that Her Majesty's Government investigates the specific circumstances of veterans coming before the criminal justice system and considers how their cases can be dealt with. Will the Minister commit to supporting any investigation by the Government on such an issue? Certainly, Deputy Speaker, if uh, the Government takes up that suggestion from the Select Committee, I can absolutely guarantee that my Department will cooperate in any work which is to be done from it. But as he highlights in the question, it is an issue for the Northern Ireland Office to consider whether they wish to take up that suggestion from the Select Committee. It will be up to the DOJ and indeed whatever other local departments may be responsible uh, for taking forward that work in consultation with the NIO, not in advance of the NIO. I call Mervyn Storey. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister what discussions or correspondence he's had with the Minister for Education in relation to the inquiry into sex and exploitation of young people, given the serious nature uh, of the allegations that have come out into the public domain over the last number of weeks? Deputy Speaker, I have not had any discussions with the Minister of Education on those matters. As I think is fairly well known, uh, I had a joint meeting with the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety and our two committees last week. Uh, that is the primary issue because the child protection issue is primarily one for social workers. Uh, there is clearly a role for the police in support and indeed an ACC attended that joint meeting. Uh, if there are specific issues which the Chair of the Education Committee thinks I should be discussing with the Minister of Education, I will happily do so. I call Mervyn Story. I thank the Minister for his comments, but was it not the case that the Chief Constable uh, is on record as having made reference to the fact that education should be involved? And given clearly that there is a correlation between justice, health and education, uh, is not it now time for the Minister to enact a process whereby the Department of Education, in all its various influences in relation to ensuring that our young people are protected and we are satisfied that everything is being done to ensure that young people and children are not being further exploited without us taking intervention to, pre to prevent it? Well, Deputy Speaker, I certainly agree with Mr Storey that we need to do all we can to protect children from sexual exploitation. Uh, there are discussions ongoing at the moment between my department and DHSSPS about the possible issues which may be followed up as we look at uh, the best possible way of providing that protection, because there are clearly issues which, uh, because they fall to both social workers and police in different ways, have relevance. I am quite happy to look to see what the best possible way of doing that is. The Chief Constable has already committed to a peer review 
of the way that the policing uh, operation has been carried forward, and I know he indicated to the Justice Committee last week his willingness to look at the possibility of a joint examination to ensure that we have the best possible arrangements for child protection in the future. If that joint work also involves the Department of Education, then there may well be additional benefits, but they are primarily not the key department. The key issue is the work being done by social workers within the Health and Social Care Trusts and the role that the police have when criminal investigations are being carried out. And that is the end of our period of topical questions, and we now move on to oral questions. And can I advise members that questions number 2, 8 and 10 have been withdrawn and require written answers. Sorry, and, and, and 2, 8 and 12 have withdrawn. Yep. Uh, William Humphreys is not in his place. Uh, question two has been withdrawn. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number three, please. Deputy Speaker, tackling antisocial behaviour is a key priority area for my department and indeed for the executive through the programme for government commitment to reducing incidents of antisocial behaviour. Policing and community safety partnerships are expected to deliver on the vision outlined in the community safety strategy as well as the objectives detailed in the policing plan. North Down PCSP's key strategic priorities for 2013-14 include reducing the number of antisocial behaviour incidents, domestic burglaries and the proportion of violent crime where alcohol is a contributing factor. The PSNI advises that a significant amount of planning and coordination with other agencies took place to manage crowds visiting parks in North Down, including Crawfordsburn Country Park, prior to the summer. That is, however, an operational matter for the Chief Constable. I call Gordon Dunn. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister give us an assurance today that, uh, that there will be a proactive approach by the various agencies to assure residents, both of Helens Bay and Crawfordsburn, that antisocial behaviour is not, is not going to become an annual scourge within their communities? Well, Deputy Speaker, I can only give that assurance insofar as the different agencies work together. And as I emphasised in my principal answer, the role of the PCSP is to do that local coordination. Uh, it's my understanding, certainly, that the police had contact with a number of other relevant agencies, but that is very much a matter for local discussion, not something which can be set as a high-level priority by the department. The department has set the community safety strategy. It's up to local people to work that into practice in each area. I call Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, antisocial behaviour and outdoor drinking activities are a scourge right across the province. But would you agree with me that PCSPs and the work that is done by local councils is the key way to tackle uh, the major part of this problem? Well, Deputy Spe Speaker, I think the key issue is that whilst we can set the overarching strategy, and clearly I recognise there are issues of antisocial behaviour and things like public drinking generally. The specific issue as to the prioritisation, as to how measures are put in place to deal with it at local level is very much one which requires local initiatives. That is the whole point of having PCSPs bringing together not just the councillors and the independent members, but now the other agencies to ensure that we get a joined up approach and that we deal with whatever the local problems are in the most effective and joined up way. So whilst I can say what priorities are at a regional level, we can only set local priorities with putting together the best ideas from local people as they find their own local solutions. And I've seen some very good examples of that being done by PCSPs, and I'm sure that North Down will not be lacking either, or will Carrick Fergus. Thank you. Yeah. Moving on, I call Rama Khan. Uh, question four. Deputy Speaker, as this is an operational matter, I have not held any discussions with the PSNI regarding the issue of a reduction in police civilian support and supplementing that support under the PSNI managed service contract. My officials approved the PSNI business case in February 2012. Approval was required as its value exceeded the financial delegated limits for the Chief Constable. I call Sam McCann. Uh, I said it's my understanding that the PSNI has already received a review and uh, with only 18 per cent of the PSNI civilian uh, staff being uh, Catholic. Uh, why would the Minister uh, support a PSNI proposal to reduce the civilian staff? Well, I'm afraid, Deputy Speaker, 
the issue of the uh, religious background of PSNI staff is not an issue for me to consider. The role of the department was purely in considering the merits of the business case. The operational decisions as to how the contracts are awarded is an issue for the Chief Constable. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. When we're on the issue of uh, recruiting personnel in the fight against crime, I know the Minister usually uses the operational responsibility get-out clause, but does he have a view as the Justice Minister that after 10 years of legalised discrimination against my community in employing police officers, does he have a view of the backdoor attempt by some police officers to implement a 50-50 regime in the latest uh, sort of compartmentalised recruitment around nationalist areas of Northern Ireland only? Could I ask members to ensure that their supplementary is clearly linked to the original question? I'll give the Minister an option whether he wishes to answer. Well, regardless of the linkage, Deputy Speaker, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, ignoring the minor points where Mr Campbell doesn't appear to recognise the constitutional role which I have, as opposed to the role of the policing board or the Chief Constable, um, I would have thought as a member of the House of Commons he would have remembered what the legislation was, but there you are. The, the reality is, Deputy Speaker, I am firmly on record as having opposed the concept of recruiting people on the basis of which church their grandparents happen to be baptised in. I want to see police officers recruited on merit, but I also want to ensure that we get the best possible representation across the community, and I believe an affirmative action is entirely appropriate at this time. I call John Dallet. Uh, Speaker, I am almost reluctant to get involved in this crossfire. Uh, but order, in, order. In the interests of the civilian workers, could I just address a simple little question to the Minister for Justice? Is he satisfied that those civilian workers will have justice in terms of uh, their payoffs and whatever else they need or require? Well, again, Deputy Speaker, if Mr. Dallet is suggesting that he has any evidence to suggest that people have not been given justice in terms of their full legal entitlements. I have no doubt that he will write to me and or the policing board and or the chief constable. I call Pam Brown. Question number five, please. Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will take questions five and 15 together. I have referred to the issue to the independent prison service pay review body for advice the pay review body is currently undertaking a comprehensive review of this issue and will report to me by December of this year. Should the pay review body conclude that it would be appropriate to pay an allowance, my department will then seek approval from DFP for any additional payment in line with normal civil service pay policy. I call Pam Brown. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Um, does the Minister agree with me that it is very unfair that around two-thirds of the prison service employees do, um, do not receive this allowance uh, given the threat that they are working under? Well, Deputy Speaker, I think that's a rather simplistic way of uh, representing what is happening. The reality is that for existing prison staff, there was a consolidation of the special allowance into the normal pay scales some years ago. We are at the moment looking at the issue of those staff who are on separately negotiated scales. Indeed, the scales which were recently agreed for custody officers in negotiation with the Prison Officers Association and accepted by them are now being re-examined to see whether it is appropriate to make any change to, the, to those, uh, those pay rates. But we do have to recognise that the existing uh, staff had the additional payments consolidated into their pay scales. They are being paid on a higher rate than their equivalents in England, Wales and Scotland. And that is the basis on which we are looking at those groups of staff where there may be some differential. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, does he not believe that this is a matter of equality, that all the staff sh should be treated exactly the same, and there should be a differential uh, between um, all those staff who fa face the same terrorist um, threat going about their daily business? With Deputy Speaker, that is why we are looking at the issue with regard to those staff who are not being paid on a higher pay scale than the, their equivalents in England, Wales and Scotland. But for those staff who are already being paid on a higher rate, it does not seem appropriate to be considering different issues. If there is a comparison being made, as has been made in some quarters, with the position of police officers 
Police officers throughout the United Kingdom are paid on the same scale, and therefore the Northern Ireland Transitional Allowance is a top-up to recognise the circumstances in which, prison, in which police officers in Northern Ireland work, but prison officers are not paid on a uniform scale across the UK. I call Raymond McCartney. Uh, I've got the last call cooler, August Buegas, Lechonera, Don Ferguson. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Whatever the outcome and the need to, to address this particular issue, uh, I would seek an assurance from the Minister that the issue is not permitted to become a blockage to the outrolling of the prison reform programme. Well, Deputy Speaker, I, I can assure Mr McCartney that that is not the position. The reform programme is going ahead. This is one specific discrete area of the pay of a small group of staff. But certainly at the me recent meeting of the oversight group, uh, I got a very positive reports of the reform programme going forward, reports which will be presented to the committee in the near future. Moving on, I call Paul Kirvin. Thank you. Question number six, Minister. The Community Safety Strategy sets out the strategic direction over the next five years for reducing crime, antisocial behaviour and the fear of crime. The strategy recognises that success in building safer communities is beyond the ability of the justice system alone and requires a partnership approach across government and the community and voluntary sectors. It also aligns with a wide range of executive policies and strategies, including the new strategic direction for alcohol and drugs. The Northern Ireland Assembly constituency profile of December 2012 states that South Antrim was the constituency with the eighth lowest drug offences rate and the eighth lowest rate of antisocial behaviour incidents. However, we all know that statistics alone do not give an assessment of antisocial behaviour. We also have to consider what local communities experience and perceptions of these issues. PCSPs have a vital role in taking forward the objectives of the community safety strategy and transforming them into reality on the ground. They are best placed to engage with local communities to assess what issues concern them and to develop action plans to address these concerns. In relation to ASB and drugs issues in South Antrim specifically, local PCSPs have developed a range of actions to address issues identified by local communities. These include the establishment of a street pastor scheme, delivery of detached youth programmes targeted at young people at risk, the Speak, Out, Speak Up, Speak Out publicity campaign to encourage reporting of antisocial behaviour and crime, public meetings on drug and alcohol misuse, delivery of drugs and alcohol awareness programmes, and provision of counselling services for individuals who require assistance with alcohol or drugs issues. I call Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for his answer. And uh, as a supplementary, I would want to just basically tease out there are, there are local problems in local areas where there is a correlation between what is perceived to be uh, crime and uh, associated drug dealing, which is going on in those areas. So, to fund their drug dealing, they are committing crime. I'm wondering, has there, is there any figure of how much money has been set aside to deal with those strategies through the, uh, the areas that you have identified in the previous res response? I don't think, Deputy Speaker, it's possible to identify funds which have been specifically set aside in that way, given that most of these initiatives are dealing with a range of antisocial behaviour and minor crime, and therefore will be dealing with issues which do include, in some cases, drugs and alcohol issues, but in other cases don't. Uh, it's not easy to say specific money is being involved in the fight against drugs when we have to look at the overall package and we're looking at the interconnectedness between different sorts of crime and different factors of antisocial behaviour. But what is clear is that there is a lot of very good work going on. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. And I wonder if he's aware of an issue that relates to antisocial behaviour in the sort of dark alleyways behind and the previous DRD's minister's policy to not replace old street lights and whether he's taking any action to ensure that a case is put as to why street lighting that isn't on main roads should be replaced. I fear, Deputy Speaker, if I was to say too much about the precise issue of street lighting, uh, his party colleague, the Minister for Regional Development, might, you know, might get at me. I can, however, say that there are certainly issues um, 
particularly as they involve uh, reducing tensions around interfaces, where the DOJ does have a responsibility for improving the quality of lighting. But I think once we get away from our responsibilities around interface issues into the general matters, it is an example of how we need to join things up. As I said earlier, the fact that the justice system alone cannot deal with these problems of low-level crime and antisocial behaviour. Uh, but I suspect I may need to refer him to the Minister for Regional Development to ensure that road service plays its part in the fight against crime. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and to the Minister for addressing some of the localised issues and indeed the regional measures uh, that his department and others have put in place. But what impact are they having on the issue of antisocial behaviour? Well, can I welcome Mr. McKinney to his first justice question time? He hasn't had the benefit of hearing me talk frequently about antisocial behaviour. Um, unfortunately, I don't have in front of me the statistics from South Belfast at the moment. But as most members of this House will have heard me say on many occasions, we have seen a significant ongoing reduction in antisocial behaviour over the last three years almost every year in almost every district in Northern Ireland. So it is clear that a lot of the good work being done by local partnerships is delivering generally. Uh, the, I'm happy to write to him about the specific issues of his own constituency, but what I think we should do is recognise that whilst there are clearly problems to address, and there are clearly in particular problems of perception, we have a success story in terms of the work of which is being done uh, against antisocial behaviour. And we should not suggest that we only have problems when we are dealing with many of them. I call David McNary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Just to ask the Minister, is he aware of an increase in protection racketeering? Well, I'm certainly aware through the work of the Organised Crime Task Force that there are problems of protection racketeering. I'm not aware of any particular increase, so I would suggest if Mr McNary has particular points which he wishes the OCTF to address, he might write to me. Moving on, I call Sandra Overend. Question number six, please. Sorry. I'll happily answer number seven, Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, with permission, I'll take questions seven and 13 together. Members will be aware from the media attention last week that I have already approved the business case and have sought executive approval of the Desert Creek project by way of an urgent procedure. Assuming it is approved within the immediate future, on-site works could begin in February of 2014. I call Sandra Overend. Indeed, I thank the Minister for answering number seven uh, for me. Thank you. Can the Minister outline the issues that may result in this project not actually progressing? And would he agree with me that this will have a major negative impact for the local mid-Ulster economy? Well, Deputy Speaker, I'm certainly happy to accept that Mrs Overend is concerned about the mid-Ulster economy. I am also concerned to ensure that the three services have the best possible training facilities. I believe that the project set forward for Desert Creek is the best possible way of delivering that. I believe what it would provide would be a real centre of excellence, which would attract attention not just from Northern Ireland, but from a considerably wider area. Uh, in terms of the factors for it to proceed, the reality is it is now at the point where it requires the formal executive approval, having been given approval by my department and it will then be a matter of the final details being sorted out for the contract to be awarded and building can then commence. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And, uh, there's, there's the, the Minister will certainly be aware that no one wants to see this happen uh, more than, than I do, and I don't think any elected representative in Mid-Ulster does. And can the Minister assure the, the House and indeed the people of Northern Ireland that the Due diligence, due, due diligence test has been carried out in respect of the preferred bidder and ensure that um, in any, when the contract is rolled out that the, um, the companies who um, are, are brought in in subcontracts will, will be actually paid. Well, Deputy Speaker, uh, just to be technical about it, we should not currently refer to a preferred bidder. Uh, there, is no, there is no preferred bidder until a preferred bidder is appointed. Uh, so what we should actually be talking about at the moment is the highest ranking bidder. It is a technical point, but nonetheless it is a significant point. Uh, certainly the, the issues, issues have been raised of concern around financial viability and so on. I have been assured by the programme board that there have been significant due diligence uh, checks be, uh, made given the size and the scale of the project. Um, a specific detailed rev uh, review was commissioned externally. 
and I, it is my understanding that there are currently no, pro, no concerns within the project board around the, uh, those due diligence matters. Written response. Question number nine, Cahill O'Hushing is not in his place. I call Sean Rogers. Question number 10, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will take questions 10 and 14 together. First and foremost, I want to take the opportunity to condemn the disorder which occurred over the summer months. There can be no excuses for the scenes of rioting and the violence directed at the police. It has come at a heavy cost with over £15 million spent policing parades and associated disorder since the 1st of April this year, and 689 officers injured during public order situations since the 1st of July last year. It has caused significant damage to community relations as well as to the international reputation of Northern Ireland. As of the 16th of September, 127 people have been arrested and 94 charged in relation to the public disorder that occurred from the 12th of July. The police have spoken about the impact that policing disorder has had on tackling other forms of crime. The diversion of police resources has undoubtedly had an impact on tackling the issues that are important to local communities, the issues that we've already discussed today, such as antisocial behaviour, burglaries and drugs. The police made 3,432 fewer arrests from December 2012 to August 2013 than for the same period the previous year. I am confident that the police service working with the policing board will continue to manage its resources in an effective and efficient manner to deal appropriately with any pressures arising from public disorder whilst continuing to deliver a personal, protective and professional service to local communities. However, however it is vital that we find a resolution to these issues if we are to avoid the scenes of violence and destruction witnessed all too often in Northern Ireland. I call Sean Rogers. Could I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive reply and sympathise with all those officers who have been hurt over the summer. But would the Minister agree with me that the, the whole flags and contentious parades are more the symptoms of sectarianism and should we not really be addressing the key issue, which is sectarianism itself? Well, I don't think it would come as any great surprise to say I agree entirely with those points made by Mr Rogers. This society cannot continue to depend upon police officers holding the line because of the failure of politicians and community leaders to build a different shared future for all of us. That's why the Haas talks are so important. That's why we need all five parties totally committed to working hard in that process to deliver for Northern Ireland. And I certainly will ensure that my party plays its part. And if there is a role for the Department of Justice in backing up some of the issues that come from it, the DOJ will not be found wanting. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, the Minister tells us there's hundreds of police has been officers injured, nearly 700, £15 million wasted on parade policing and diversions away from other crime and indeed more. Can the Minister or does the Minister agree that this simply cannot continue? And rather than, than talking the Haas process down, as the Minister has referred to, all of the parties in Northern Ireland should be putting in every effort to resolve the contention that is around parades. Yes, I certainly agree. I suppose I, I should say that, thankfully, of the 689 officers injured, relatively few were seriously injured. But nonetheless, that toll of injury is a colossal statement of the debt that this society owes to the members of the PSNI and, indeed, briefly to mutual aid officers during the summer as well, although, thankfully, very few of them were injured. And it is a clear indication of the need we have to ensure that we do not just talk up the Haas process, but commit to ensuring that the five-party talks succeed in resolving those difficult issues of parades and policing and the past and the sectarianism which underpins all of it. I call Paul Given. You, uh, could I ask the Minister what steps he will be taking in the Haas talks uh, to make some uh, recompense uh, to dealing with the hurt and the pain that was inflicted on members of the unionist community by the decision of his party, the SDLP and Sinn Féin, that inflamed the tensions by removing the flag from City Hall? Deputy Speaker, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be here answering questions on behalf of the Alliance Party, but since you're allowing questions, I'll give answers. What happened with regard to the flying of the flag on Belfast City Hall 
was a compromise put forward by the Alliance Party between a proposal that there should be no flag and a proposal that there should be flags every day. I am quite happy that the Alliance Party put forward an honourable compromise in line with the flag-flying policy of the majority of councils in England, Wales and Scotland. In recognition of Northern Ireland's constitutional position within the United Kingdom and also recognising the divisions which exist in this society and how people feel these matters. So that is the reality of the decision I took and I give no apology for putting forward a reasonable balanced compromise on the part of my colleagues in Belfast City Council. Indeed, I am proud of what they did. I deeply regret the fact that certain people chose to target the Member of Parliament for East Belfast. I regret the way in which the issue was personalised, the threats that were made, the injury that was suffered by police officers and a variety of politicians, not least in my own party. But there is nothing that I have to apologise for. I call Jerry Kelly. Um, since we're talking about uh, flags and uh, parades and protests and the public disorder around that, would the Minister agree that the Parades Commission is uh, working in a very difficult uh, circumstance, especially uh, due to the increase in uh, parades and contentious parades? And would he also agree that it is uh, critical that uh, there is a continuing need for a regulatory body, body for parades and uh, indeed protests? Well, of course, the matter of the Parades Commission, Deputy Speaker, is not currently devolved, but I agree entirely there is a need for a regulatory body. Not only is there a need for a regulatory body, there is a need for all politicians to respect the decisions of that regulatory body, whether they like them or not. I call Jim Mallister. Thank you. It's right and necessary, of course, to condemn public order, and I join in doing that. But speaking of the Parades Commission, has the Minister any concern? Uh, of the provocative nature of the absurdity of some of their decisions, such as at Tordell Avenue, where it seems unable to cope with the fact that that protest has been peaceful and therefore has a provocative act to try and provoke conflict, it has now come up with the ludicrous imposition that loyalist bands can't play loyalist music in loyalist areas. The members Does the Minister question. think that's an advance or is that a provocation? Well, Mr. Alistair asked a number of questions. First of all, I'd like to condemn public disorder rather than condemning public order. I think that would probably be a more positive step. I repeat the point I made. Whether or not people like the decisions of the Parades Commission, it is the body established by statute with regulatory powers, and its decisions should be respected. I call Alex Easton. Number 11, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, much good work has been done, and I'm confident that the prison service will continue to move forward, particularly as the structural changes near completion over the next six months. The target operating model encompasses four key elements, the staff deployment agreement, the staffing profile, the staffing structure, and the shift patterns. In combination, this will deliver a sustainable model for the prison service to deliver efficiently and effectively. The staff deployment agreement was developed for, following a number of months of detailed negotiation between NIPS and the Prison Officers Association. It sets out working practices that can support a progressive and purposeful regime that is focused on rehabilitation, and it's been in operation since July of 2012. Work is continuing towards full implementation of the new staff profiles and structures. All new entry custody prison officers have now been trained and deployed to establishments. A number of prison escorting staff who opted to move to the custody prison officer role will transfer near the end of this year. Concerns have been raised by staff about the new shift systems. Ongoing reviews and updating of shift patterns are a normal part of prison operations and reflect changing needs and the requirements for regime delivery. Any changes in future will be sensitive to the concerns of staff. I call Alex Easton. Could I thank the Minister for his answer? Is the Minister aware that under the TOM operational model that female prison officers are being left alone at night to manage sex offenders' wings where the over 55 section are allowed to come in and out of their cells 24 hours a day. And can he tell us what he plans to do to protect those vulnerable uh, women prison officers who are left alone on those uh, single units? No, Deputy Speaker, I'm not aware of that situation because that is not the case. And that is the end of questions to the Minister for Justice.
Thank the member for putting that on the record. Point of order, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Deputy Speaker, um, we've just had uh, question time and before that, uh, topical questions to the Justice Minister. At the outset of topical questions a few weeks ago, the Speaker uh, indicated how, what he expected from the new regime, and he indicated that there should not be a, a, an alteration between uh, topical questions and the questions on the order paper. Perhaps the speaker, you could draw the Speaker's attention to what appears to be an attempt uh, under question time to the Justice Minister just now uh, at question number 12 by Mr Alistair, who deliberately withdrew the question in advance and then posed it as a topical question in spite of the Speaker's ruling at the outset. The member has put his concern on the record. Um, <coughs> topical questions will be kept under review uh, over the next coming of weeks and indeed months.